ball when uh, Fellow was last person off the bus. But since some people have straggled and got behind him, I'm going to start with the last person off the bus. The people that have straggled uh, are S uh, S O L. <laughs> Another anachronism. <laughs> tight schedule. Now what, we're, now what we're in front of is a uh, looking at the USS Cairo. USS Cairo, briefly, was one of the first seven river iron class built from the keel up. That work how you use various definitions. It was on the, she and her sisters were armored with 122 tons of iron, so they're not completely, uh, they're not completely an armored vessel, such as monitor posts. They were built by James Buchanan Eads, his contract was to deliver them in six, signed on the 10th day of October, was to deliver them in 64 days. It would be better than Henry J. Kaiser. With the seven vessels, four of them built at Carondelet, the suburb of St. Louis, three including Cairo built at Mount City. They got, you know, they, they, they're all uh, accepted by the Navy on the uh, 15th day of January, 97 days after the date they were to be completed. So there's some de 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 debate on who owns whose money. Whether each owns the government a lot of money, because he's supposed to pay $200 per day on each vessel penalty fee if it's not delivered by the date uh, specified in the contract, which would be the 12th day of October, 97 days late. Uh, Darrow herself, the ironclads will first see action at Fort Henry, which is good for. Uh, uh, Mr. Ease, because they capture Fort Henry uh, before the army is in position to attack. In the period in between the attack on Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, again, Cairo this does not participate in the attack on Donaldson. Uh, the uh, third auditor decides that both the government and Ease have, have impaired the obligation of contract and orders Ease to pay the return. Cairo will first see action in the Battle of Club Point Bend on 10th day of May 1862. Uh, she will see action again at the Battle of Memphis on the 12th day of May 1862. Since she did not participate in the earlier battle, battles, uh, the title of my book is Hard Luck Iron Clan. Her hard luck will continue throughout her career, both afloat and uh, in her resurrection. Cairo will first fix, visit Vicksburg during the exchange of prisoners in September 1862 and will become the first vessel sunk by a torpedo, as, it, as the Confederates called them, in front of the call of the day on 12th day of, 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 of December 1862. Uh, two, when Cairo, a sister of Pittsburgh, a uh, uh, Mara and Signal, uh, Tim Clad, and Queen of the West go on a reconnaissance of the Yazoo River. Cairo uh, goes off into unreconnoitered waters, which Commander Selfridge was admonished not to do, runs afoul of two infernal machines, and is one of his brother officers. Uh, who doesn't like Annapolis men very well, will say Mr. Selfridge went up the Yazoo River on the 12th day of December and removed tor two torpedoes by placing his vessel over the top of it. <laughs> <laughs> now the damage that sent the hero to the bottom is indicated in the area on the port quarter. When the vessel was raised, uh, uh, the damage there was minimal. Uh, uh, but, of course, uh, as I said, hard luck in the raising of the vessel uh, and uh, the lack of funds to get enough polyethylene glycol to uh, put, a, put the vessel in a, uh, a shower of polyethylene glycol for several years and caused heavy destru uh, destruction of the timber. Now, with your round table, would it first become cognizant as an organization with Cairo when they visit the Visit Vicksburg in 1961 because in the on in September mid September 19 uh, uh, 1960 uh, with the uh, with the 
uh, support uh, by the Mississippi INI board, uh, with support uh, by local volunteers. Uh, we succeeded in raising the Kiros uh, the uh, three, four years after, uh, four, th three years and nine months after uh, Warren Grabo, John Jackson, I relocated the Grabo Cairo. Uh, we were able to raise uh, the uh, pilot house from the Cairo and one nine-inch naval gun. When you visit, when your group, when your group visited Vicksburg, and the uh, first, uh, this first, uh, this first, uh, the first full weekend in May in 19. Uh, uh, 61, uh, the pilot house of Cairo, which you can see there, was on display uh, with a Confederate flag flying over it, uh, down there uh, by the seawall on the Vicksburg waterfront. Uh, the uh, the Cairo, uh, the nine-inch gun, which had been recovered from the Cairo, was displayed in a crater. And the first significant money we uh, received from any sources uh, was from the Chicago Roundtable in a campaign to raise money uh, to raise the care. So from the very beginning, uh, the Chicago Roundtable had some interest and in support of, of CARO. We began, the CARO operation uh, began sub, uh, uh, to try and raise the CARO. Operations go uh, in the fall of 1962. When we had a lot of, uh, the, the biggest nut of the many nuts associated with the Cairo was Jackson Jakes of the New England Maritime Museum. Uh, he is a legitimate certified nut because the last time I heard he was in an institution. <laughs> <laughs> they did a survey of Cairo uh, uh, in which uh, using airlifts, uh, it was surveyed and found that she was in, kind of embedded in a capsule of, of, of mud at the bottom of the Yazoo River, uh, all apparently without her back broken, uh, lying uh, a little bit uh, uh, with her stern a little downstream uh, from the bow, which had been driven into the bank's bows on. This roused considerable interest in Cairo. Uh, governor Ross Barnett, who was under a lot of, uh, and who at the time was the governor of Mississippi, hosted a, br a breakfast and invited us all to go up and see, which was one of the hot items in the Mississippi political campaigns at that time, the gold fixtures in his bathroom. <laughs> Invite all of us to come up and see them and use them. So I have used the gold fixtures in the uh, governor's mansion. The other big thing was uh, earlier on that was Kennedy spending a night in the uh, governor's mansion. Uh, in the administration prior to, uh, in the Coleman administration, which was prior to the Barnett administration. And that was a big thing in getting Barnett votes, which enabled him to defeat Carol Garden for governor. So those bathrooms have a lot of importance. <laughs> <laughs> the governor mansions so always got to have a little humor to, your, to our story. So in 1963, uh, we go back uh, with very little money, a lot of enthusiasm, 20,000 bucks. I went on a TV program, 20,000 bucks contributed to another by a, by a Vicksburg businessman, uh, no, excuse me, a Mississippi businessman, not a Vicksburg businessman, and endeavored to raise the Cairo uh, by using uh, using uh, two uh, barges, using uh, uh, and using buoyancy. It failed uh, when high water uh, dislodged the barges on the seventh day of March. Some of you people who were with us in 1961 can well remember uh, Sir Wal uh, uh, Dr. Walter Johnson, who played the villain in The Gold in the Hill. Uh, in February of that year, our most enthusiastic local advisor, uh, 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 supporter uh, will be killed in a tragic accident when he falls in the uh, Yazoo. Warren County commissioners get involved and give us $40,000. Uh, we enter into contract uh, with uh, uh, Billy Biso, the largest salvage man on the Gulf Coast, and he says, I'll raise your vessel for $40,000, no pay, no cure. That means that you have no supervision. Uh, it doesn't cost you any money if he doesn't raise it, but you don't tell him how he's going to raise it. 
Uh, and of course, uh, not knowing certain key features, for instance, uh, we did not know at the time that Billy and his, his father had died, that Billy and his wife were in a lawsuit over the family estate. And we had a lot of clout over Billy we didn't know we would have had, because we, he definitely doesn't want his equipment in Louisiana. Uh, which would have been important because when we're, everything is going well, we lifted the Cairo up out of our grave, moved her upstream about uh, 100 yards, set her back down, and we, are, we sink a barge 40 feet wide, 240 feet long, in the grave out of which Cairo had been wrestled. Now, that you've got to be a pretty good navigator because the vessel is flat on the bottom and the vessel is 41 feet on the bottom. And you're going, to, you're going to position aboard a barge that is 40 feet wide. The river was very low. Uh, with, and that's the, the, the big catch. The river was low, and Biso says, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's raise her. Now, we had good engineers. Uh, we thought the river would be was too low, but uh, they raise it. The river is not low enough. It's not, it's too low, everything goes well until the part of the vessel that's out of the water is probably from the, uh, from the pictures, uh, there's only one picture that exists because films were not big in that day. Uh, you can see the three gun ports, they weren't up to the guns yet, uh, but uh, it was all, uh, the iron was blue gray, which indicates it had not been suffered, it had not been subject to oxygen, then she'd gone to the bottom. Uh, you can see the Battle Wheels fighters coming into view out in the middle, all aligned. And then there was just too much strain on the uh, wood because below the knuckle, the vessel is all wood. The, knuckle, the, the, the iron extends below the knuckle for 55 inches. And the wire, two wires slash deep into the vessel with the, uh, like you would a uh, knife through hot, uh, hot knife through butter. And the vessel has to be raised in seven parts. And then it becomes a long struggle to uh, get the vessel restored. It was taken down to Pascagoula, Mississippi, at Ingalls Shipbuilding Yard, and there it's going to remain until 1977. Uh, exposed to the elements, uh, uh, kept wet down initially, as there's a big battle on between the Mississippi A and I board uh, and uh, the city of Vicksburg, the Warren County Board of Supervisors over where the vessel will be put, money dries out, and Senator Stennis had promised uh, that he would get money to uh, restore the Cairo, but it was conditioned by one thing. The Vietnam War has to be over. Uh, so as soon as the Vietnam conflict war winds down, uh, Senator Stennis gets three and a half million bucks, uh, more a little approximately that figure, and then with the saps of returning the Cairo uh, beginning in 1977 to Vicksburg, building the visitor center, reassembling the vessel takes place. And uh, the first, the visitor center opens first uh, because it's completed first. The exhibits are on display in there. And the uh, vessel is then open for exhibits. So uh, uh, then they had, uh, as, as some people wrote who were here, I have at least one person in here was in 1961. Mr. Davis says, I, are you the only one here from the 61 trip? I was here too. All right, we got two. Oh, yes. He has to be. John I, is not right. I, I, missed, I missed him on purpose. <laughs> he put his hand up because I met him on the last day. And he and I, uh, when we have the roll call, he will stand up. He will be standing up when I have to sit down. So he and I are having a contest of longevity. Uh, standing there uh, before they go to Mr. Crowley, who is who is junior to both myself and Mr. Falkenberg on tours. So, uh, so there have been two here. But the number of you were here in 91, and you can remember, uh, what was it, 93? 93. One trip before this. 93. Well, I better memory on the earlier trip. At that time, they had put on a, uh, a covering door that was not very satisfactory, and the uh, birds were uh, finding it a good place to do-do on. Uh, the vessel was drying out rapidly, and, uh, and uh, Trent Lott and uh, Dad Cochran got more money, and that's the reason for the new type of covering over the Cairo. Any questions? I'll take a couple of questions, and then we want to give you time to look at the objects and then go to you. Those who want to, on a fast walk through the vessel, then we're going to turn you loose, and I'm going to ask uh, 
Uh, before we do that, uh, I'm going to, uh, Jerry and Parker are going to uh, let Tar Jerry and Parker make their comments, and then we'll take questions. Then I'll lead a fast walk through the vessel, and then you're free to go on with Also, allow me to introduce you, if I may, to uh, Wayne Mansfield. Wayne is in the audience here. Wayne is our city planner. Uh, Wayne is a dear friend of the park. He worked on our cannon crew here at the National Park for about 12 years. Well, Wayne is getting married this weekend, and accompanying Wayne today is his future father-in-law, Lieutenant Colonel Bob Pitts. Uh, Bob, where are you at? They're around somewhere, maybe in the uh, museum right now. Just a word about the gunboat Cairo. When Cairo was brought to Vicksburg in 1977, as Ed mentioned, it was placed under the shade of a canopy, a metal canopy. The canopy was of very small dimension and did not provide the necessary protection to the gunboat from the intense. The American people. Unfortunately, that enclosure was deemed too expensive, and so the vessel was initially placed under the display of this canopy. But the canopy rusted through, the vessel wasn't properly protected, and it was deteriorating at a very rapid rate. When we approached the senators with the idea of replacing this canopy, we once again urged upon them the need to place this vessel in an environmental enclosure where it could be adequately protected from the elements. Unfortunately, again, we were told that it was too expensive, not only too expensive to build, but even more expensive to maintain over the years. And so they did agree to get us the money for a new canopy. Now, the canopy that had initially existed over the gunboat had cost $150,000. The proposed new canopy, $1 million. So we secured a million dollars from the Congress of the United States, but it took so long for the appropriation to go through the Congress that the cost on the canopy had gone up to $1.6 million. And so we went back to the senators, we secured $1.6 million, but in the time that had elapsed, the cost had gone up to $2.5 million. Getting $2.5 million, the cost had gone up to $3.1 million dollars and that is what this canopy above you today cost the american taxpayers 3.1 million dollars interestingly enough the environmental enclosure was estimated to cost about six million dollars this particular canopy is made of a cloth material it's the exact same material that is over top of the airport in denver for those of you who do frequent traveling it has a life expectancy of between 15 and 20 years so probably by the end of my career with the National Park Service, it'll be time again to approach. Mississippi and ask all of our school kids if we give a nickel a day or give up our dessert money for one year to help raise the K-Run. So instead of your lunch costing 30 cents, it costs 25 cents, but you didn't get cake or pie at the end of the lunch. So I want to thank Ed because if it weren't for that, I'd probably weigh 250 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> one of the other more unique ways of raising money, I don't know if um, many of you are familiar with the story, but Ed actually went on TV to the uh, $10,000 pyramid show and one funding for Operation Cairo. Uh, do you recall what the uh, the question was, Ed, that you won? Well, the, the, the one I won, the one, the one that wins it for me, because it was a very cumbersome format because of what had happened to the $64,000 question uh, to make you uh, purer than Caesar's wife. <laughs> uh, so uh, 
Uh, you, you, you're an contestant. You, you formulate the questions. Uh, you were under guard for the time you arrived in New York City uh, with a private dick, uh, so you couldn't communicate. And then after you got your questions formulated, you had to have them reviewed by a Civil War expert and a, a person that, that was uh, uh, knew how to double use, how to have a uh, English West language uh, questions put so they could not be double meaning. So that meant we had to go all over and come up with a new formula that would meet these people right here. And I was ready to walk out before the program went on. Well, the question, uh, the, the, the first one was each West asked is a one part. Both of us got that. Then comes up the second question. And uh, mine was, uh, uh, it was easy. Uh, uh, the, the one that he went down on, on his first part of the two-part question was, uh, who commanded uh, the... Uh, the expedition at, uh, at opening the river, or the cracker line at uh, at, uh, at Chickamauga. Uh, who was in charge of the uh, of the uh, uh, the pot and boats and uh, the barges came down river. The poor fellow said, "Fury," and it was Hazen, and the money was in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> now you won ten thousand dollars. Is that correct? Twenty thousand dollars. Now I know if I went on a TV show and won twenty thousand dollars and offered the money to Operation Cairo, I'd be a divorced man by now. <laughs> <laughs> but Ed's wife, uh, what did she say to you, Ed? Well, uh, she she uh, she was as almost as she was a more enthusiastic than I was on the Cairo. That is where the mud settles in the river of water. Now, if it's not nervous, if it can press the steam there, the shell hits that structure. You better get to your soul. responsible for the defense of the Vicksburg-Jackson enclave, draw them into the northern portion of the state of Mississippi. There, keep them pinned, while the other wing of his army, under Sherman's direction, would take advantage of Union naval superiority on the inland waters, embark at Memphis, and move rapidly down the river, skirting the flank of the Confederates, and hopefully capturing the lightly defended city of Vicksburg. It was a very good plan on paper. Unfortunately for Grant and Sherman and their Union soldiers, things just wouldn't work as planned. 
as Grant's Army begins its southward march in late November of 62, they do make it into North Mississippi. There they do have the desired effect of drawing Confederate forces from the Vicksburg-Jackson area under Pemberton's command into the northern portion of the state. Pemberton initially digs in along the line of the Tallahatchie River. Grant seizes upon this opportunity as cavalry forces cross over the river from Helena, conduct a raid in the rear of Pemberton's army with the intention of getting astride the railroad at Grenada. Although they do reach Grenada, they try to set the railroad bridges there on fire, but it is wet weather, the flames just do not spread, the bridges are not destroyed, and the Federal cavalry is forced to withdraw. But Pemberton, seeing the vulnerability of his line of supply and communications, uh, threatened in such a fashion, will evacuate the line of the Tallahatchie and fall back to the line of the Yalabusha there around Grenada. There again, his army will dig in and construct a series of nine forts connected by a continuous line of trenches and right bits overlooking the Yalabusha River. As Grant's army comes up against this line, he sees an unportable stream in his front, a powerful line of fortifications on the south bank crowned with cannon and gleaming with bayonets, and realizes that he can't go any farther. But of course, his intention is keeping Pemberton pinned. So he's quite pleased with the operations of his army thus far. It is about this time that Sherman's forces will embark on transports at Memphis for their phase of the operation and begin moving down river. But while Grant is, is approaching the line of the Alabusha, his ever lengthening supply and communication lines become critically exposed. Raiding Confederate cavalry led by Earl Van Dorn and Nathan Bedford Ford will get astride his line of supplies, cutting the railroad forcing Grant to fall back on Memphis. Sherman, however, leaves Memphis the very same day of this raid against Grant's advance base at Holly Springs. Although rumors have reached Memphis that something has gone awry, those rumors have not yet been confirmed. So Sherman, true to his mission, will embark his command, move downstream from Memphis, tying up for the night at Helena, Arkansas. At Helena, he receives additional reinforcements of troops here the rumors are in fact confirmed. Grant is falling back. But the other prong, this two prong attack now destroyed. Rather than fall back, Sherman is convinced that by taking advantage of Union naval superiority on the inland waters, he can move more rapidly downriver toward Vicksburg than could the Confederates utilizing interior rail lines move from Grenada south to Jackson and then west over to Vicksburg. It is a race. It is a race that William Sherman will lose. We discussed that here at our first stop on Chickasaw Bio Battlefield this morning. Now, you know the topography in this area is low, swampy bottom ground. Much of the year it is inundated by floodwaters of the Mississippi and the Azoo rivers. Now, you'll see in just a few moments the pavement will end and we'll get onto a dirt road or a gravel road. That's about the height of the floodwaters each and every year. The county just cannot maintain hard surface road beyond this point year-round. You know that many of the buildings you see off to your side, for example, are built up on piers simply to try to keep them above the floodwaters that are prone in this area. But we are heading uh, toward the Yazoo River. We're moving along the route of advance of A.J. Smith's Union Division. This would be the extreme right flank of the Union advance at Chickasaw Bayou in December of 1862. Sherman's men come down river. They will move up the Yazoo River, disembark along the This is as good a place as any. So he ordered his columns forward, 
furious battle that raged throughout the day. Sherman would be easily and luckily repulsed. He would lose 1,776 men. Patriotic number, I guess. But uh, Confederate casualties are less than one eighth that number. One of the uh, more interesting items we have in our collection at Vicksburg National Military Park uh, deals with this area. Just off to your right over here, you'll see glistening uh, off the, the waters of the sun, like glistening off the waters of Alligator Lake off to your right. Now, it's not called Alligator. his eyes and there was this alligator with his teeth chomped down on this guy's leg and he was dragging him out of the tent and into the waters of alligator lake well fortunately for this union soldier there was a stack there was some stack muskets just outside the tent as this alligator was dragging him past he reached out with his arm and grabbed one of these stacked muskets that had a fixed bayonet on it and he stabbed the alligator killing the alligator and so we have that skin in our collection, with the triangular hole in it, the, the fella did lose his life. That's one of the more interesting items we have in our collection. I'd like to put it on display. But they, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and they get rather large. It's not that uncommon to see a 12 footer out here. And that's just the alligators. The snakes are even bigger. <laughs> so now we've broken into the so stream. Sacrifice Roger will you see the we'll use him as a lure in the lake. It is the stream <laughs> known as the Yazoo River. The Nindy River of Death. The Yazoo River flows from your right to left and will confluence with the Mississippi River about 10 miles off to your left, north of Vicksburg. During the winter of 1862-1863, as A.J. Smith's Union Division disembarks here along the banks of the Yazoo River and starts winding its way in toward the high ground known as the Walnut Hills, they will bivouac in these fields. Now, these fields today don't look too bad, but back in the winter of 1862-1863, this is just an almost a bottomless quagmire of mud. The fires are not permitted whatsoever. During the entire time period, the Union Army is here at Chickasaw Bayou because it will give away their position. It will also attract incoming Confederate artillery fire. And so not only are these men bivouacked in a vast sea of mud, they have no hot coffee, no hot food, they're wet and cold all the time, very miserable conditions. We'll soon be getting to the Yazoo River where the Union fleet would tie up on December the 26th. This would be the area where the troops were actually disembarked and begin their attendant operations toward the better night on the ground floor of Vicksburg. River and heading their way. Fortunately for the Confederates, 
about an hour driving time north of here, Lake Providence, Louisiana, there was a Confederate telegraph station. Late on Christmas Eve, a young black girl barged into the telegraph station and informed the two Confederates who were manning that post that there were boats on the river, lots of boats, come and see. So these two Confederates staggered through the darkness to the bank of the Mississippi River, and they're out on the water glistening in the moonlight. They could make out these huge, dark shapes, and they made them out to be Union gunboats and transport vessels loaded to the gunnels with fresh troops heading toward Vicksburg. They counted 81 vessels. Obvious word, the alarm had to be spread. And so they raced back to their telegraph station where the message was clicked over the keys, sent by a wire down here to the small hamlet of DeSoto office of the river from Vicksburg. The courier there, Philip Fall, deciphered the note and realized its importance. He immediately jumped in a small skip road and
So they had to go. I count up. They've gone aboard. Uh, they come off boats twice. They've gone back on boats twice. And they moved about four or five times. Now on the 20th, on the 27th and 28th, they're going to push the boat. Yes, of course. And we're going to do Yeah, we're going to let it wait. 
Ohio, just like Shelter Fair, and get up on that side. Now, as other brigade, the course is going to advance forward. They're going to attack, occupy this place. The Cumberland Road going over here, and of course, the Confederates to fall back. Now, uh, we've got Lambert, and that will be out. He's going over here, and get over here. Uh, he's got Lake and trying to approach him by the, by the uh, uh, racetrack. George W. Uh, Morgan L. Smith is the casualty, so we've got David Stewart. Uh, now, he is not a very reputable warrior. He's going to get this far. Yeah. He has succeeded to the command of George uh, uh, Morgan L. Smith. So, by the evening of the 28th, Sherman is planned as his follows. He has the crossing he's got, he has the end of <coughs> There's Indy Mountain, used to be a wonderful place to hide from it. And the Hennessy used to dig a lot of 20 pounder pair of shells fired by the Illinois Cotton. And you have an Indian Mountain, the banks are very, very steep. And that's going to be one place they're going to cross. The other place they're going to cross here is at the, uh, at the Corduroy Bridge across Dickens, Ohio. Right now, Steele has been abandoned his route. He's going to come in here. And the Confederates, now the Confederates have grown a lot. The Confederates have brought in lots of reinforcements. No Union reinforcements. They have had, of course, coming down from Grenada, since Grant is retrograding. The pressure is on Congress, who is now come to Vicksburg. And they have sent down Vaughn's Brigade of East Tennessee Boys. They've sent in coming in from all the way from Furbysboro, Tennessee, our partners for Georgia, and we have Great Tennessee who have arrived. So the Confederate force now here is rapidly increasing. You can imagine Sherman's So that means Sherman, one of the key elements of Sherman's plan, again, frustrated by his feet, the eagerness to get here, has been uh, frustrated because he's left the number of his pot down back in Memphis. He also knows he's the clarity that's a down the river. So you better do something on the 29th because the river is <coughs> rapidly. This person doesn't fall around. On to our next stop.
here at Chickasaw Bio happened in the east on December the 13th of 1862, the Battle of Fredericksburg, in which Ambrose Burnside's Union Army and Stoney was hurled across the river, stormed the high ground around Marie's Heights and elsewhere, only to be bloodily repulsed with the loss of 12, 13,000 soldiers. The nation's mood is not very good. The president himself is going <coughs> for victory on the field of battle. So though Sherman does not think his chances of success are very good at this location, he cannot withdraw from this area without making an assault. The assault is expected, therefore the assault will be made. But I think we'll see a pattern beginning to develop here at Chickasaw Bio. You take a look at Sherman's operations here in December of 62, then at Vicksburg in May of 63, and again at Chattanooga in the fall of 1863. I think you'll discover that in this case and elsewhere, that if Sherman does not think his chances of success are very good, he will minimize the number of troops that he throws forward. Here at Chickasaw Bio, as Ed mentioned, he has several divisions. And on the main day of assault, he will throw two full brigades and part of another brigade forward to a very small percentage of his force. Enough, however, to show that he has made an attempt, but not so many where he is minimizing his task. He will repeat the same performance at Vicksburg on May 19th of 1863. How many brigades the Confederates have facing? How many brigades yeah, the Confederates just have? Many, sure. uh, right off hand, I think four or five. That's true. Now uh, that's
October the 26th. He will immediately begin deploying his troops and sending them inland to reconnoiter, also clear the landing area so that they in turn can stockpile munitions, quartermaster stores, commissary supplies, and so on. As the lead elements of Sherman's troops are advancing down this road on December the 26th, at the far end of this field, where you see that white church in front of us, that's where they will encounter Confederate resistance. Confederate skirmishers are out in front of their position, out along the banks of Chickasaw Bayou, and there they will announce their presence. As a result, the Federals will slow to a crawl at, at nightfall on December 26th, simply being bivouacked here in this field. For the next two days, December 27th, December 28th, Sherman will continue the disembarkation of his command reconnoitering the area and pushing his troops ever so slowly toward that bluff line in the distance, trying to consolidate his position and develop his plan of attack. Sherman quickly realizes there are only five avenues of approach to the Confederate position on the high ground. All five of those positions cross water courses. All five of those avenues of approach Of that large force, he will only send two full brigades and part of a third forward against the Confederate fortifications. Now we have come to Chickasaw Bayou. Chickasaw Bayou is flanked by this stand of trees to your left. It's a sluggish stream, normally fairly shallow, and on the day of the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou, this stream is uh, many feet uh, above where you currently see it. In fact, one of the two brigades sent forward is a brigade of troops led by General Frank Blair. They will be ordered to wade the Chickasaw Bayou on the afternoon of December the 28th and advance on the opposite bank of the stream from where we currently are. Those men will have to take off their cartridge boxes, attach them to the rifle muskets, and hold them high over their heads. And even by doing that, they're barely able to keep their cartridge boxes out of the water. The water's up to their armpits, up to their chins. And so they wade through this very cold stream on the night of the 28th. Temperatures plummet down to around freezing that night. No fires are permitted. No hot coffee is available. You can imagine the miserable, uncomfortable condition that these groups are operating in. Well, we're advancing along what's known as the Lake Road. It's known as the Lake Road due to the fact uh, Judge Lake, a local Vicksburg judge, had a summer residence out here along Chickasaw Bayou. His widow, Annie Lake, uh, resided in that house, and so this is known as the Lake Road. Now, Sherman's troops advance from this position on December the 27th, slowly wind their way forward. They will finally, by December the 28th, uh, advance beyond Mrs. Lake's private residence. Sherman will 
secure that structure as his headquarters. And it is at Mrs. Lake's house on the night of December the 28th, 1862, that Sherman outlines his plan of advance to his subordinate officers. You recall his words. We will lose 5,000 men capturing Vicksburg. This is as good a place. You have to read George W. Morgan, who is not, although he's an Ohio, he is not an inspirer of our man. So that, that, that attack is off. So what is the attack going to be? We're going to advance. Now, the one is, if you're in the courses for day, you're going to have the 22nd Kentucky, the 54th Indiana, the 42nd Ohio, and the 16th Ohio. 
their line of advance is going to be where we are. They're going to have, with this, this operation being less graded, you're going to have torture here, you're going to have the layer here, and you're going to have Giles Smith here. Um, the 13th Illinois out in front, and the 6th Missouri in their hands of the line. We've also got a man who's way over here, uh, hung up in front of that tablet. So the Union are going to attack. Now you can imagine what's going to happen to Jacorsi is to man across the narrow causeway and try to deploy and move against the Confederate position up here and using the longer main line of resistance, which is a river road with their cannons up on the high ground. But Jacorsi is going to get shot up. His brigade is going to get repulsed rather savagely and rather uh, with ease, but again, as Terry points out, Sherman's losses in the three days are not going to be catastrophic by the long side. Uh, and he will, and again, Blair is going to advance, going to cross this water course, advance against Greg's men here at Peter Tall. North Carolina is going to cross in this area, uh, down uh, west of the causeway, Peter Tall. And these fellows are going to uh, climb up those steps up by the 13th Illinois. Get up there and have a, a real fight with these uh, Louisiana and Mississippians who may take a black up there and Sherman is repulsed. Now, Sherman at least shows his intellection. Uh, Grant probably wouldn't know what he's talking about <coughs> uh, because Grant at West Point, never, if military history was only in your last year, as principally in military engineering. So if you read about any of the great captains, you had to check them out from the library. Fortunately or unfortunately, but fortunately for Grant, they show that in West Point, he checked out romance novels. Not <laughs> novels. No books about Napoleon, no books about Lloyd. Sherman has to be done. He's going to paraphrase Caesar when he landed, landed the time. I landed at the time, appointed the sovereign and state. Uh, he will also lose easy number to remember, 1776. The Confederates lose to the 202. Uh, Sherman has failed. Uh, he's going to try some other operations, such as use a, use a commando type operation of sending to the west up the river in the fall, supported by the gunboat. Uh, land the they're going to break up the raft at Snyder's Bluff, but by the, by, by, by the morning of the first river hit the rise, uh, this, even this tall man here is looking at the barks on the trees, and he's going to come out of here on the second, and go 
go back and meet a very high rate price for the reason that I'm going to turn it over to my two colleagues. Overview. Thank you. Okay, let me take it's important to point out here at Chickasaw Bio that the Confederates have the advantage of a defense in depth. Now, exactly what does that mean? As you look to the high ground in front of you here, it will actually be a tiered defense. The Confederates do have skirmishers out here where you see the railroad track today. Then, as Ed mentioned, their main line back along the river road, then tiered up that bluff line are lines of trenches and rifle pits and the artillery ground on top. As a result, even if Sherman's men were successful in punching through the first or second line of Confederate resistance, there are still other lines of defense to go. As a result, Sherman's chances of success here at Chickasaw Bayou are very slim indeed. We're standing right where the causeway was. If you look behind you a little bit, you'll see the bank of Chickasaw Bayou. Also, if you look in this direction, you'll see the opposite bank. The stream is banked full during the time of the battle. Consequently, the only way to cross it is this narrow causeway, as Ed mentioned, about half the width of the current road today. So reminiscent of Ambrose Burnside at Antietam, these men are charging over a bridge in the presence of the enemy and take high casualties in this location. But once they cross that causeway, the course will actually take the time to stop his men Try to make sure that these men would be properly honored. Already the VA had provided Confederate headstones for Cedar Hill, but these 40 U.S. soldiers, I'm sorry, 44 U.S. soldiers, had no stones whatsoever. So we approached the Veterans Administration with the idea of getting 44 U.S. headstones, and we had no problem doing that. But when we approached the sexton at the city cemetery, he said that the Confederate clock.